Hola amigos y bienvenidos otra vez por una semana interesante de español. Uh, esta semana exploraremos el capítulo 12, que será de nuestro planeta. So, obviously, as you can see from the visuals here at the beginning of the chapter, you see a photo of a bear here, as well as some pollution and then some global warming. So lots of things are going on here. Uh, this is an interesting chapter. In this chapter, we're going to learn how to identify vocab related to the environment and the animal world. Uh, we're going to be creating sentences regarding what one will do in the future using the Spanish future tense. We'll also be creating sentences explaining what you've done using the Spanish present perfect tense. And then finally, we're also going to be learning about the subjunctive this week as we learn how to explore impersonal expressions, doubt, and uncertainty. So, as we get started, you see um, this is the very first section of vocabulary in your book, and it, uh, there's a little um, caption that goes along with the photo here. It says, La naturaleza nos ofrece las vistas más bellas del planeta, y cada uno de sus componentes es vital para preservar el balance del medio ambiente. So, um, you can see that nature offers us the most beautiful views of the planet, um, and each one of its components is vital in preserving the balance of the environment. And as you look here, we have lots of cool vocab words. You have el río, the river, el río, el bosque, the forest or the woods, la isla, an island, las nubes, the clouds, el cielo, the sky, las montañas, the mountains. Oh, there's a fun word here too, las palmeras, palm trees, las palmeras, I love that word. La costa, the coast. Uh, la ola is a wave, la arena, sand, el mar, the ocean. Obviously, you have lots of cool stuff here. There's also some words here that accompany your chapter that are very specific to the environment, and I strongly recommend that you spend some time with those flashcards and mind tap that you really learn these words. They're going to be very important. Um, just to hit a few of the highlights, we're going to be talking about el reciclaje in this chapter, recycling, um, los desechos industriales, industrial waste, La contaminación, also known as la polución, uh, la deforestación, el smog. You, uh, you can see lots of um, very interesting things here. Uh, note the difference here in a cascara, which is a cascade or a waterfall, and a catarata, a very large waterfall. So something like Niagara Falls would probably be a catarata, whereas a, a smaller waterfall, maybe a community one, would be a cascara. Okay, so make sure you know the difference. Uh, speaking of, as you look at the vocab in this chapter, you can see here in this activity titled Un Poco de Logica, it's asking you to go through and select the uh, word that best fits the sentence. So in number one, me encanta ir a la blank y disfrutar del mar y de la arena. So uh, I love to go to the blank and enjoy the sea and the sand. Well, I don't know about you, but I love to go to the, your options are costa, the coast, or colina, the hill. Uh, in this case, costa is a better option here, la costa. Um, so I want you to take a moment, I want you to pause your audio, and I want you to give these a try. In just a moment, I'm going to show you the answers. We'll talk about a few of them and let you check them. Make sure you have a good understanding of your vocab, okay? All right, now that you've had a moment to give these a try, let's take a look at the answers. And number two, we see in blank, hay muchos insectos y animales exóticos. So in the blank, there are a lot of insects and exotic animals. Your options are el llano, the plain, or la selva, the jungle. So in the jungle, there are a lot of insects and exotic animals. That makes the most sense. Number three, el blank está entre montañas. And your options are valle, a valley, or cielo, the sky. <laughs> I think the best option here would be valle. The valley is between the mountains. Uh, number four, unas de las blank más impresionantes son las de Niagara y las de Iguazú. Uh, we were just talking about these, uh, some of the waterfalls that are most impressive are Niagara and Iguazú. So, cataratas, waterfalls, big ones, cataratas. Number five, in the blank, hay muchos árboles. So, in the forest or in the desierto, the desert, obviously el bosque makes the most sense here in the forest. Number four, or excuse me, number six, las blank son muy grandes hoy. The blank are very big today, and your options are olas, the waves, or cascaras, the waterfalls. I don't think waterfalls generally change that much in size, not daily at least. So uh, the best option here would be olas or waves. 
Uh, number seven, el reciclaje o el petróleo es un recurso natural no renovable. Uh, blank is a renewable, or excuse me, a natural resource that is not renewable. The best option here would be petroleum or oil. Uh, number eight, una península está rodeada por blank, por tres lados. So a peninsula is surrounded by blank on three sides. Obviously a peninsula, uh, you probably learned in early years of school, a peninsula is surrounded by um, usually water, a body of water. So in this case, we have el mar, el mar, the sea. Okay, so that is uh, just a short little intro on the environment. Like I said, you can spend more time on exploring those with your flashcards and making sure you know what's happening there, but just wanted to make sure you got a brief little introduction to those there. The grammatical focus of this chapter is actually the Spanish future tense, which is one of my favorite things to talk about ever. I love the future. Um, you actually already know how to say things in the future. Uh, you learned this back in Spanish 1 when you had the ir plus a plus infinitive construction. For example, we had voy a pescar en el lago este fin de semana. So voy, I am going. Voy a, I'm going to blank. So when you throw that infinitive in there, it's translated as I'm going to blah, blah, blah. So voy a pescar, I'm going to fish. Voy a ir, I'm going to go. Voy a comer, I'm going to eat. So in this case, voy a pescar, I'm going to fish. Uh, sometimes you also just use the plain old present tense to express something in the near future. Uh, as you can see with the second sentence here, we've said, salgo para las montañas mañana, leaving for the mountains tomorrow. Literally, it says, I leave for the mountains tomorrow. But um, as I said, we can sometimes use the present tense to project the future uh, when it's near, the future is near. Um, but those are things you learned back in Spanish 1. Now that you're getting a little more advanced here in Espanol 3, we want to make sure you uh, know the proper way to say these things. So we're actually going to learn the future tense. Um, and the future tense is cool. It tends to be a little bit more formal in conversation. Like you're probably going to hear voy a comer instead of comeré. It's going to be more common to hear that. But uh, either one is perfectly grammatically correct. You can use either one. Like I said, I love the future tense, so I probably use it too much, but it's my fave, so it's okay. Um, now, as we take a look at these, the weird part about the future is the conjugation process, right? If you remember back to Spanish 1 and 2, you always had these verbs that ended in AR, ER, or IR. And to conjugate them, you had to take off that AR, ER, IR, and start adding things to, to do your conjugation. Well, in the future, that's not the case. We actually leave the whole verb there. So here in orange, you see the verb hablar, which means to speak or to talk. And these are our future tense endings, uh, which are the same for AR, ER, and IR verbs. You just have one set of endings to learn, which is kind of nice. The cool thing about the future is we take this infinitive, hablar, and we just throw these endings on there, hablaré. Hablarás, hablará, hablaremos, hablaréis, hablarán. And you have your verb, I will talk, you will talk, he or she will talk, we will talk, you all will talk, they will talk. And it's already there. All you had to do is take those endings and throw them on there. So that's pretty exciting. As I said, for ER and IR verbs, you have the exact same endings, e, as, a, emos, es, an. And you're just throwing those on the verb. You don't have to do anything, don't have to take anything off. You just take your infinitive, comer, escribir, hablar, whatever it might be, and throw these endings on there. So here, comeré, I will eat. Comerás, you will eat. Comerá, he or she will eat. Comeremos, we will eat. Comeréis, you all will eat. Comerán, they will eat. So on and so forth. You can see those already conjugated for you. Um, the future tense, just a few more examples here for you of the same thing. In our first sentence, we have el grupo irá a la isla primero. So the group will go to the island first. They just took the verb ir, to go, and slapped an A with an uh, accent on it on the end and ended up with era. They didn't have to do anything fancy. They just said that the group was it, um, using our bottom left box here, third person singular. So they threw the A on there and they got ira. In our second sentence, we have esquiaremos en las montañas este vierno. We will ski in the mountains this winter. Um, so they took the verb esquiar to ski, and they threw emos on the end to say that we will ski. Um, now, as every good thing must come to an end, unfortunately, all verbs are not that easy. You can't always just take the verb and throw the a, asa, emos, es, an on the end. Unfortunately, like all the other tenses in Spanish, there are irregulars. The good news is that there are only 10 irregulars, and if you memorize these, they'll be very helpful to you later in the class as well. 
So um, as we look at these irregulars, you have the verb decir. Uh, this particular verb, all, ooh, I didn't mean to do that. This particular verb, all that happens is that the stem changes to dir, dir. And then you throw your endings on here from the future. So diré, dirás, dirá, diremos, diréis, dirán. Haber changes to H-A-B-R. So abre, abras, abra, abremos, abres, abran. Hacer, the stem changes to H-A-R. So arre, arras, ara, haremos, ares, aran. Uh, same thing with poder. Uh, the stem for poder is P-O-D-R. Podra, so you get podre, podras, podra, etc. Poner is P-O-N-D-R. Pondre, pondras, pondra. Querer is quer. Notice the double R there, quer in your stem. Saber, S-A-B-R. Salir, S-A-L-D-R. Tener, T-E-N-D-R. So you get tendré, tendrás, tendrá, tendremos, tendréis, tendrán. Then with uh, venir becomes V-E-N-D-R. Vendré, vendrás, vendrá, etc. Uh, you see a sentence here as an example. Allí podrán ver el volcán. There, they will be able to see the volcano. So they took the verb poder. They knew the stem changed to P-O-D-R. Our subject was they. So we used our bottom right box, our A-N ending here. And they said podrán. Allí podrán ver el volcán. El volcán, excuse me. Um, now, as we continue looking at the future tense here, uh, I do want to take a note here about this verb a ver, I did show you the stem here with H-A-B-R. Um, a ver is always going to be conjugated in the singular form, regardless of whether or not it's followed by a singular noun. So I always tell my students to remember, basically you're always just going to use habrá. So habrá 20 personas en la excursión. It doesn't matter that there were 20 people there. We're not going to use they. We're not going to say habrán. It's just habrá. Uh, this is the same haber in the present tense, if you remember back to Spanish 1. Haber actually is I in the Spanish tense. Like, I siete personas aquí. I veinte personas en la excursión, etc. So, as we look at these, it's always going to be habrá. Just remember that. And guys, if you can memorize these irregulars, you're going to be set. These are kind of hard, uh, but once you memorize them, they're going to be helpful to you. And the good news is that they will also help you on your... Um, in a later chapter, when we begin to learn about the conditional, these will be really important. So please just take note of those. Make sure you know those. As always, I want to give you una oportunidad para practicar un poco. Uh, this activity is called Nace un Ecologista. An ecologist was born. Um, and it tells us we're going through, and you see all these verbs bolded and underlined in white. I want you to take all those bolded and underlined words, and I want you to change them to the future. So, for example, number one says, Yo usar menos electricidad. I to use less electricity. So, we want to take this to use, and we want to conjugate it by throwing on the proper ending. So, uh, you may recall from earlier, our ending in the yo form should be e with an accent. So, we're going to say that yo usaré menos electricidad. And then the later part of the sentence there says, apagar las luces al salir de un cuarto. So I'll use less electricity and I will turn off the lights upon leaving a room. Uh, apagar was to turn off. So I want to add my E with an accent and I get apagaré. Okay, that's kind of how these work. I want you to take a look at numbers two through six. Notice there's two blanks for pretty much all these. So I'm going to give you a minute here. Uh, remember, you can pause me and restart me when you're ready for me. Uh, be careful to watch out for irregulars here, okay? And good luck. All right, now that you've had a second to take a look at those, let's look at your answers. Number two says, yo les, and my verb here was decir, to say or to tell. You may remember that the stem for decir changes to D-I-R. And then since I am telling them, yo les diré a mis amigos que deben comprar solamente productos ecológicos. I'll tell my friends they should only buy eco-friendly products. Number three, en el supermercado, mi esposa y yo, pedir solamente bolsas de papel, obtener bolsas de tela reusables. So, in the supermarket, my wife and I will ask for only paper bags. So, we're going to take our verb here, pedir, to ask for. This was the we form. My wife and I would be she and I, we. So, we're going to add hemos to the end. Uh, mi esposa y yo pediremos. We will ask for only paper bags, and we will have um, reusable bags. So, 
Our verb here originally was tener, but you may remember tener has a stem change in the future to t-e-n-d-r, and then we add our normal we form ending on the end of amos. So right, so we took t-e-n-d-r, and we added our ending here e-m-o-s. So we had tendremos. We will have. Okay. Uh, number four. These are both irregular. No, so, both regular. Excuse me. Nosotros no conduciremos un coche que consuma mucho gasolina. We will not consume a. Um, we will not drive a car that consumes a lot of gas. We just took the verb conducir and added amos there on the end. We will not drive. And compraremos uno más económico. So we took comprar and added amos. Compraremos uno más económico. Number five, yo les explicar a mis amigos que es importante reciclar y ellos aprender a proteger el medio ambiente. I will explain to my children that it's important to recycle and they will learn to protect the environment. So I will explain my subject here in the first blank is I. So I'm going to take my verb explicar, throw my future tense ending on there, e of an accent, and get explicaré. I will explain to my children that it's important to recycle. And they will learn. I'm going to take aprender here to learn. Um, you may recall the future ending uh, for the they form is a with an accent in. We're going to throw that on the end and we get aprenderán. They will learn. Aprenderán. And number six, I will not take my children to school in a car. We will be able to conserve a lot while we walk to school together. So, yo no Llevaré a mis hijos. So we took the verb llevar, to take or to carry, and we added an E with an accent. So I will not take my children to school in a car. We will be able to talk, conversar. I read that incorrectly the first time. We'll be able to speak or converse together while we walk to school together. So our verb here was poder, to be able to. The stem changed to P-O-D-R, as you saw from uh, back here in this slide. Poder was irregular, P-O-D-R. So we took that, and then we added amos on the end. Nosotros podremos. We will be able to. Okay? So that's the future tense, guys. Not too, too horrible. Hopefully you feel pretty decent about that. Uh, the next tense you're going to learn about in this chapter is the present perfect tense, which just happens to be my second favorite tense in Spanish, okay? Um, the present perfect is easy. It is translated as has or have in English. So, for example... Um, I have eaten dinner tonight. Um, I have not um, had any dessert yet. So has or have. Um, the present perfect tense is formed using the verb haber along with a participle. So let's, uh, let's break that down. As we start with haber, you can see haber is conjugated in the present tense as e, as, a, hemos, habéis. An. Okay, be careful how you read these. It's not he has ha. Okay, e, as, a, hemos, habes, an. Say it with me. E, as, a, hemos, habes, an. Very good. Okay, so that's our haber word. So uh, this is what's going to change according to the subject. So if I have done, oop, if I have done something, I'm going to say e. Whatever, he comido, I've eaten. If you've eaten, has comido. He or she has eaten, ha comido. This is the part that changes based on the subject. Comido, eaten, doesn't change. It's the person who has or has, has or have done the eating, those people that has or have done the eating, is what's going to change. So, for example, here as we continue to look, uh, you can see the participle is formed in Spanish. If the verb was an AR verb, we chop off the AR and we add ado on the end, A-D-O. If the verb was an E-R or an I-R verb, we chop off that E-R-I-R and we add ido. So you can see hablar became hablado. Comer, comido. Vivir, vivido. Uh, you can see these continually changing here. So um, before we get into allowing you to practice with these, first I want to make sure you have an understanding. So remember, the present perfect tense is formed by using a form of haber, e asa, hemos avesan, depending on who is talking, and then the participle, formed by removing the ar and adding ado, or the erir and adding ido. Unfortunately, there are irregulars in the present perfect tense as well. Uh, there are four here that just have accents. The verb creer becomes creído, 
This is really not that irregular, okay? If you were to take off the ER and just add the IDO that we just talked about, uh, you would have something very similar, it just wouldn't have the accent. Uh, we do have to add a written accent here because it changes the pronunciation of the word, and there are two vowels side by side, so it becomes creído. Something with oír here, if you were to take off the IR, you do add back IDO, but again, you have two vowels side by side, so we end up with oído. Again, same thing here with leer, leído, and traer, traído. Okay, so really these are not that irregular. You're still taking off the IR, ER, and adding ido. However, uh, you're also adding a written accent when there are two vowels that are side by side. Those aren't that weird. The ones that are very weird are the ones that do not follow the rules. Um, there are irregular participles, and we did discuss these back in chapter 11. Um, in this case, uh, you learned about Mr. V. Peach DVD. These were all of your irregular participles that we used back with a star in chapter 11. Um, so morir, for example, there's no such thing as morido, it's muerto. Um, romper, for example, there's no such thing as rompido, it's roto. So you have these going forth with your irregular participles. Um, now, the very important thing to remember about the present perfect tense that's kind of weird from other verbs, in the past, when you were using these participles with a star, back in the last chapter, uh, you were making it agree and gender a number with the subject, because in that case, it was functioning as an adjective. So for example, you said like, man, um, las luces están encendidas, the lights are on. Um, in that case, Encendidas was feminine plural because it had to agree with las luces, which were also feminine plural, right? In this case, with the present perfect tense, that's not how it works. Um, when you're using this participle with the form of haber, the e, as, a, hemos, habes, han, when you're using a participle with haber, it's part of a verb. So therefore, it does not agree and gender a number with the subject, okay? So literally, all you have to do is take off the ar, add auto, Take off the E-R-I-R, -R, add Edo, or use one of the Mr. V. Peach DVD irregular participles that you've already learned about. Uh, some examples here. Ella ha trabajado mucho esta semana. She's worked a lot this week. A lot of people see this and then go, oh my gosh, ella, it's a female. I should say ha trabajado instead of trabajado. That's not how it works. Remember, this is a verb, the present perfect tense. So therefore, Again, you do not have to make a degree in gender or number. You're literally just taking off the AR and adding auto, taking off the ERIR and adding ido, uh, or remembering those irregulars from Mr. V. Peach DVD. Another example. Ellos han ido a la costa. It's not han idos, just ellos han ido a la costa. They've gone to the coast. Okay. Uh, now, a little trick with these. Occasionally, you may see this present perfect tense uh, used along with a direct object, it or them, an indirect object, to or for, whoever, to or for me, to or for you, to or for him or her, or sometimes a reflexive pronoun, me, te, se, nos, os, se, all those things you learned in the past. Sometimes you will see a verb that has um, that included. So for example, you see, no se han despertado todavía. In this case, my verb was despertarse, and I took the se, moved it to the front, in front of my conjugated verb. I added an, because I was saying they have it. And then with despertar, I just took off my ar and added auto. So, no se han despertado todavía. Another example, ya lo he visto. It, I've already seen. Um, we didn't say, yo he visto lo, I have seen it. Because my direct object pronoun is coming in front of my conjugated verb. So again, in the present perfect tense, if you have a direct object, an indirect object, or a reflexive pronoun, it is always going to come in front of the conjugated form of haber. No exceptions to that. Um, here are some phrases that you often see used with the present perfect tense. Uh, we already just saw one a second ago. Ya means already. Recientemente, recently. Nunca, never. Alguna vez, ever. And todavía, uh, which can mean still, or no, todavía, not blank yet. Some examples. Ya hemos ido a esa playa. Uh, we've already gone to that beach. Ya hemos ido a esa playa. No han llegado todavía. They have not arrived yet. 
Oh, we're in question form. ¿Alguna vez has escalado una montaña? Have you ever uh, climbed a mountain before? So, ¿alguna vez? Have you ever? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, as always, I want to give you a chance to practice these. Uh, thinking about a camping trip here for a second, okay? So, uh, it tells us here that este es nuestro quinto día de excursión. This is our fifth day out on the excursion. I would already be dead. Hasta ahora, up until now, caminar más de 100 kilómetros. So up until now, we, or I, have already walked more than 100 kilometers. Now, you kind of have to play with what the subject is here. Read back to that first sentence. It's our fifth day of the excursion. So up until now, instead of saying I have walked, we want to say we have walked. So, uh, let's start with our form of haber. Remember, the present perfect is always formed by using haber plus a participle. Our participle is going to come from the verb caminar here. And you remember that you just chop off the ar in caminar, and we add back aro in order to get our participle. So we have that, but we do need to go back and change our form of haber here. We're saying we have walked. So if you remember back to your haber forms, you have a, as, a, Amos aves an. So obviously here I'm saying that we have walked. So I need to change aves to amos. In this case, hemos caminado más de 100 kilómetros. Okay. Uh, as we continue here, it says, pero no ver ningún animal salvaje, excepto un grupo de castores. So uh, up until now, we've walked more than 100 kilometers. But we have not ver. We haven't seen any savage animals except for a group of beavers. So we haven't seen. Again, the form of haber here that we're going to use should be amos. And ver, I bet you want to say vido. But unfortunately, that's not right because ver was part of Mr. V. Peach DVD. And ver becomes visto. Amos visto. Okay. Hope you're feeling good about these. I'd like for you to take a moment, pause your audio, and please give numbers three through eight a try for me. All right, now that you've had a second to look at these, let's take a look at the answers. Uh, so, like I said before, um, up until now we've walked more than 100 kilometers, but we haven't seen any savage animals except for a group of beavers. That blank, muchos árboles, and our verb here is destruir. So we're saying that a lot of beavers, um, a group of beavers, had destroyed a lot of trees. Now. Uh, for this one, I actually put on destruido when I was doing the answer key because I was going fast. Beavers, in this case, would be they. Um, so I said beavers would be they, on destruido. However, it says a group of beavers. So technically, group is our subject here, so it really should be a destruido. Um, sorry for my mistake there on the answer key. It should be a destruido. The beavers, the group of beavers has destroyed instead of the beavers they have destroyed. If you took out Grupo here and it just had castores, you could say on. Okay, so not to confuse you more. Uh, es una lástima ver tantos árboles destruidos. It's a shame to see so many destroyed trees. Hace mucho frío por la noche. It's, uh, it was really cold at night. Y por eso yo no dormir bien. So it was really cold and therefore I didn't sleep very well or I haven't slept very well. Uh, we're going to take dormir. Chop off our IR and add ido. And then, of course, the yo form of haber should be e. So, yo no he dormido bien. I have not slept well y, y me siento muy cansado. I'm feeling very tired. Además, yo tampoco comer muy bien porque Gerardo trajo una comida enlatada horrible. So, additionally, I also haven't eaten very well because Gerardo brought some canned food that was horrible. Okay, so we're going to take comer, we're going to chop off our ER in comer, add ido, you end up with comido as your participle. Again, the yo form of haber should be e, and my final answer is e comido. Down here in number six, you start to get a feel of what it's like when we have that reflexive attached. So, sin embargo, uh, nevertheless, debo admitir que nosotros divertirse mucho. So, nevertheless, I should admit that we... I've had a lot of fun. So our se, since I'm talking about we, becomes nos, and it gets moved to the front. Remember, uh, indirect object pronouns, direct object pronouns, and reflexive pronouns always go in front of my conjugated verb when dealing with the present perfect tense. So we have that. 
Next, um, the haber word that goes with we, since I'm saying we, nosotros have had a lot of fun, is hemos. And then with divertir, you just do the normal thing, chop off your IR, and add ido. No hemos divertido. Number seven, a Gerardo le encanta la fotografía y tomar muchas fotos para compartir a nuestro regreso. So Gerardo loves photography and has taken a lot of photos in order to share uh, upon our return. So I wrote here is tomar, simple and easy. Trap off your AR, add back auto. And my subject here is Gerardo. We're saying that he has taken. So my haber word to go with Gerardo should just be a, a tomado. Okay, and then number eight, ¿Alguna vez hacer tú este tipo de excursión? So have you ever done this type of excursion? Uh, the tú form of haber is actually as, H-A-S. And then hacer does not become asido because it's part of Mr. V Peach DVD. It becomes as hecho, as hecho. Okay, uh, I did plan some additional practice for you here, and we'll take a look at just a few of these. Feel free to fast forward if you're already understanding and getting this. Um, but it tells you here, number one, ¿Alguna vez bucear ustedes en el mar? Have you ever gone uh, snook, uh, what do you call that, snorkeling uh, in the sea? So we're going to take the verb here, bucear. We need to chop off the AR. And we add auto for our participle. We know that we're asking in the ustedes form, have you all. So my subject here should be on. An buceado ustedes en el mar. Have you all ever gone snorkeling or scuba diving in the sea? Number two, uh, I have never, yo nunca, ver un volcán activo. I've never seen an active volcano. So my haber form here should be a, the yo form. And ver is irregular, as you know, it becomes visto. Visto. Okay? I want you to take a moment. And por favor, give numbers three through five a try for me, please. All right, now that you've had a second to try these, let's take a look. Number three says that Nora y Cristina dormir toda la noche en una selva. Oh my goodness. Nora and Cristina have slept an entire night in a jungle. Wow. Okay, so if they have slept, the haber word to go with Nora and Cristina should be an. Dormir is a normal participle. We just take off the IR and add ido, and you get an dormido toda la noche. Number four, Leonardo hacer un viaje a la Antártica. Um, so we're saying that Leonardo has made a trip to Antarctica. I think I just misspelled that, sorry. And uh, we're, as we go to say this here, Leonardo, uh, the haber form to go with he should be a. Hacer is an irregular participle, so instead of asido, it becomes hecho. Leonardo ha hecho. Number five, nuestra profesora practicar deportes extremos como el alpinismo. Our professor has practiced extreme sports, such as mountain climbing. Uh, as we say that she has practiced, our haber word to go with she should be a. Practicar is our verb. As we chop off the air and practicar, we need to add back aro which in this case forms our participle, a practicado. All right, hopefully you're feeling better about the present perfect tense. All right, the vocabulary that you see in this next section of our chapter is about animales. I don't care who you are, animales are fun. All right, so the caption you see here for this photo is, Algunos de los animales de la ilustración no pertenecen a una granja. ¿Cuáles son? So some of the animals in this illustration do not pertain to a granja, which is a farm. And you can see a, a picture here, a granja of the farm. Uh, and it asks, who are these people? Well, as you look, you see over here uh, in the tree, you see la ardilla. Funny, I actually learned this word from my uh, friend who studied in Argentina. And uh, if you know anything about Argentinian Spanish, you know that they pronounce the double L as a sh sound. So they would, instead of ardilla, my friend said, oh, look, una ardilla. Ardisha, and I'm going, what the heck, an ardisha? Uh, he was trying to say ardilla, which uh, is, you know, perfectly correct in Argentinian Spanish, but ardisha, ardilla, a squirrel. As you look down, you also see some ovejas here, some sheep, ovejas. Here we have vacas, cows, 
I look like a vaca now after quarantine, but las vacas, okay. Uh, up here we have a jirafa, a giraffe, a jirafa. El águila, an eagle, el águila. Oh, look over here. We have conejos, little rabbits, conejos. Here we have cerdos, pigs. Maybe I'm a cerdo instead of a vaca. Cerdos, pigs. Uh, here we have pollos, uh, chickens. Gallinas, hens. El pavo, a turkey. La tortuga, a turtle. La rana, a frog. Los patos, ducks. Oh, and look, el pingüino, a little penguin. So, cool farm animals. You also have other words that are um, included in this chapter that were not able to fit in that photo. Uh, lots of good things here. You have la ballena, a whale. La cebra, a zebra. El cocodrilo, a crocodile. La llama, a llama. El mono, a monkey. El oso, a bear. El tigre, a tiger. El tiburón. A shark. So lots of um, lots of good words here. Make sure uh, you take note of the classifications over here to the right. You have amphibios, amphibians, aves, birds, mammíferos, mammals, peces, fish, and reptiles, reptiles. So in this first activity here, I'm going to ask you to take these animals and classify them as either an amphibian, bird, mammal, fish, or reptile. Uh, for example, in the Morelo, we have a gorilla. I'm sure you'll never guess, but a gorilla is a gorilla, and a gorilla is a mammal, a mamífero. And number one, you're given the word cocodrilo. A cocodrilo is a crocodile, and you hopefully know that a crocodile pertains to the reptile family, and therefore we said reptil, reptil, okay? I want you to take a moment, pause your audio, and give numbers two through five a try for me, please. All right, now that you've had a second to try these, number two talks about a pinguino. Oh my goodness, it's a penguin, a pinguino. Well, what type of, uh, what, what group do pinguinos belong to? Well, pinguinos are birds, actually, so they are uh, aves. And number three, a zorro. A zorro is a fox. Be careful not to make that word feminine. A zorro is a fox, and a fox is a mamífero, a mammal, a mamífero. Oh, number four, a tiburón. Uh, sometimes my students have trouble remembering this word because it's not like a cognate. It doesn't look like anything else. Uh, there's actually a song you may have heard. Tiburon, do, 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 do. Tiburon, do, 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 do. Tiburon. Mama, tiburon, do, 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 do. The baby shark song. Uh, tiburon is a shark. So, uh, anyway, a shark, it pertains to which one of these categories? You are correct. It is a fish. A pez. Pez. And finally, number five. El águila, an eagle, is a bird, un ave. All right, hopefully you're feeling pretty good about these animals. This is one of my favorite lessons to teach in person. I actually make my students start to make animal sounds, so um, I won't embarrass you and make you do that here online, but you might have to do those one day. Okay, so, all right, so I'm going to skip over this part because I think you guys can learn those. Our third grammatical portion of this chapter pertains to the subjunctive, okay? And specifically, uh, this part of your book talks about the subjunctive and then personal expressions. But I want to start just like, whoa, what's the subjunctive, right? We want to need, we need to go over that too. So um, brace yourselves. The subjunctive can be a little challenging for students, all right? But we're going to take baby steps. We're going to make sure you feel really good about it. And we're going to go from there, okay? So I start out with this first slide. Subjunctive, what? Okay, so Spanish, just like English, has more than one mood. Uh, so be careful, the subjunctive is not a tense. We've been learning about tenses here. You learned about the future tense, the present perfect tense. The subjunctive is not a tense, it's a mood. All these other things you've been learning about, the present tense from Spanish one, preterite and imperfect from Spanish two, uh, even the present perfect and the future, those are all part of the indicative mood, okay? So the indicative mood is used to express things that are for sure. They're factual, they're real, they're definite. Her hair is brown. His name is Landon. She is really nice. They went to the movies. All of those are real, definite, factual actions or states of being, okay? The subjunctive, on the other hand, is used for more 
hypothetical situations or even subjective situations like, man, I wish that I were a millionaire. Am I a millionaire? Sadly, unfortunately, I'm not, okay, but I wish that I were. Um, that's subjunctive. It's hypothetical or subjective. Um, I wish that she would be nicer to him, okay? Is she going to be nicer to him? Well, we just don't know, okay? But it's subjective. It's hypothetical. I wish that she would be, okay? Um, so, again, um, as we look at, I just want to make sure you understand the difference in the indicative and the subjunctive. Again, the indicative is used to talk about things that you're certain about, either will occur in the future or have occurred. So the sentence I gave you an example here says, Las águilas están en peligro de extinción. Eagles are in danger of extinction. That's, there's no question to that. It's, we're not unsure. It's a fact. Eagles are in danger of extinction. It's something that has already occurred. In contrast, though, the subjunctive or the subjunctive mood is used when we're talking about some type of hypothetical event, doubt, uncertainty, wishes, fears, emotions. Um, you see in this sentence, es terrible que las águilas desaparezcan. It's terrible that the eagles may disappear. Well, up above, notice we said they're endangered. That There's no doubt there, they're endangered. It's terrible that they may disappear. Will they disappear? Maybe. Will they, will they not? Maybe. We don't know. It's hypothetical. It's uncertain. There's the subjunctive. Now, I realize that can be a little challenging for you. Um, so I want to give you some hints to kind of help you with this just a little bit. Uh, by the way, I have to give you uh, my joke here that I always tell in class about Justin Bieber. Uh, you know, you've heard that song. If I was your boyfriend, I'd never let you go. I can take you places you ain't never been before. That kind of thing. Okay, if I was your boyfriend, blah, blah, blah. Well, you can see Sheldon here for the Big Bang Theory, and he's saying, well, Justin actually meant if I were your boyfriend, because Justin forgot to use the subjunctive, okay? Um, was, in this case, would be the indicative, right? Whereas were implies that hypothetical, that subjunctive situation. Obviously, Justin Bieber is not your boyfriend, but if I were your boyfriend, I'd never let you go. So we need to write the Biebs and let him know he should have used the subjunctive. Okay, so again, the big idea here is that Sometimes we have these feelings and these opinions about things we can't control. It's good for you to exercise every day. Does that mean you're going to? <laughs> Sadly, hope, maybe you should, but probably not. I hope that you study tonight. Are you going to study? Well, I hope you do, but you might go to a party. You might do something else. I don't know what you do with your life. Okay, so there's uncertainty. I doubt they know where I live. Again, uncertainty, subjunctive. As you look at subjunctive in sentences... Um, you're always going to see the beginning with an independent clause followed by a K and then the dependent clause. So people learn the subjunctive and they want to start using it for everything. Okay, that's not how it works. There are certain rules as to when you can use the subjunctive. You always, 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 always are going to have a change of subject. That means there's two subjects in your sentence. I hope that she blah, blah, blah. I hope that you, blah, blah, blah. Notice my subject changed. I went from I, subject one, to she, subject two. I went from I, subject one, to you, subject two. Okay? There has to be a subject change. If you say, I hope that I become rich one day, that's not subjunctive. Okay? Because in this case, there's not a change of subject. So you got to be real careful here, okay? You need to change the subject. You have to have a K in the middle. And then you have to have some type of weirdo verb. And if you're wondering what weirdo is, weirdo is here. It's an acronym that stands for wishes, emotions, impersonal expressions, request or recommendations, doubt or denial, and the verb ojalá. Now, for the purpose of tonight's lesson, or for this chapter's lesson, we're only going to be working here on impersonal expressions and doubt and denial. We will get to these others at other points in the semester, but right now we're worried about impersonal expressions and doubt and denial. Uh, going back to this photo for just a second, notice in this sentence you have an independent clause, which is usually written in the indicative tense. Insisto in que. I insist that. That's just normal old present tense. And my verb is insistir. I took off my IR, added an O. Plain old present tense, insisto. Insisto en que. I insist that estés en clase a tiempo. 
I insist that you are in class on time. Notice my, my second verb here after my subject change is estes. So again, notice I had a change of subject. My first subject was yo, yo insisto. I insist that you, there's my second subject, are in class on time. So generally it's the verb, not generally, always it's the verb in the dependent clause that comes after the K, after the second subject. That's always going to be the one sentence subjunctive. My first verb in sisto, present tense, normal indicative, no worries, okay? Remember, you need two subjects, a K and a weirdo verb. If you have all those things, then after your second subject, that verb is going to be in the subjunctive. Here's another example. In English, I hope that you study tonight. Notice, I hope, there's my weirdo verb, from wishing. That, there's my K. You, oh, there's my second subject. Here is I, my first subject, you, second subject. Study is going to be in the subjunctive. Same thing here. I doubt that they know where I live. I doubt, there's the D from weirdo. Doubt, that, there's my K. They, there's my second subject. First subject was I, second subject they. That means no is going to be in the subjunctive, okay? Let's take that and let's apply it to Spanish here a little bit. But first, let's make sure you know how to conjugate the subjunctive. This is where it's kind of weird, okay? So the rule is you form the yo form of the verb in the present tense. You drop off the o of that verb once it's conjugated. And then you add the opposite ending. So I came up with a little rhyme here to help you. Form the yo, drop the o, add the opposite. And what I, what I mean when I say opposite endings, if you had a verb that was originally an AR verb, it's actually going to use the ER, IR endings. And if you had a verb that was an ER or an IR verb, it's actually going to use the AR ending. So it's kind of the kind of backwards, kind of the opposite of what you would expect. I know that probably doesn't make sense yet, so let me give you some examples. Here we're looking at the verb hablar, which is an AR verb. So here's hablar in the box. I'm going to form the yo. We all know the yo form of hablar is hablo. I'm going to drop my o. I'm left with H-A-B-L. Then I add the opposite ending. So up here you can see my endings. Hablar, again, is an AR verb, so we're using ER verb endings instead, the opposite endings. So I form my yo, drop my o. I throw my opposite endings on here, and I get hablé, hables, hablé, hablemos, hables, hablé. Notice, I put some stars here, the yo form and the el, ella, usted are always going to be the same in the subjunctive. So you have to look at the context of the sentence to see if I'm talking or he or she is talking. Okay. Uh, let's do another example here with an ER verb. This is the verb comer, to eat. Um, so again, form the yo, como, drop the o. You're left with com and add the opposite ending. Comer was an ER verb. So instead of using ER verb endings, we're going to use the opposite. We're using AR verb endings. We throw those on there and we get coma, comas, coma, comamos, comais, and coman. Again, the yo form and the el, ella, usted are always the same in the subjunctive. Okay, and finally, let's take a look here at an IR verb. You're given vivir, which is to live. Um, so form the yo, vivo, drop the o, you're left with viv. And add the opposite endings. Vivir was an IR verb, so therefore instead of using IR or ER verb endings, it's going to use the opposite. It's going to use an AR verb ending. So you end up with viva, vivas, viva, vivamos, vivais, vivan. Again, the yo form and ele usted are going to be the same. Okay? Now, unfortunately, uh, there are irregulars here in the subjunctive. Um, the reason, if you're wondering, gosh, why do I have to form that yo form just to drop off the O? Can't I just take off the AR and add the opposite? No, no, no. You have to form the yo first, okay? And the reason why, you've already learned over the course of your Spanish career so many irregular yo verbs like tengo, indigo, and hago, and traigo. You know so many of these already. So it's important that you form the yo first and then you drop the O. A good example of this is the verb tener, to have. Tener, the yo form is not teno, it's tengo with a G. If I did not form the yo form first, 
I could not get to the subjunctive. So for example, when I form the yo, I get tengo. I drop the o. Tener was normally an er verb, so I'm going to use the opposite endings, going to use my ar verb endings. So I get tenga, tengas, tenga, tengamos, tengais, tengan. Okay, so again, it's important that you uh, form the yo form first. Um, as you keep looking here, you see es importante que conduzca, sorry, es importante que conduzcas, I wanted to say conduzcamos for some reason. Es importante que conduzcas con cuidado porque hay venados. It's important that you drive carefully because there are deer. The sentence means more to me now than ever since I hit a deer at Christmas last year. Uh, it's important that you drive with caution. So again, take my verb, conducir. Form the yo form. If you did not know that conducir were in a regular yo form, it would mess up your subjunctive conjugation. Of course, if you're ever unsure, feel free to visit www.spanishdict.com. Um, and there on Spanish Dictionary, you can go and click on the, the word conjugation and type in conducir, and it will give you the yo form when you're ever unsure. So form the yo, conduzco, drop the o, and the opposite ending, you get conduzcas. So very important you form that yo first. Um, this also applies to stem changing verbs, okay? If you have a verb, which is an AR, this is very important, an AR or an ER verb, and it's a stem changer, it's going to follow the same pattern as the present tense. That means it's going to change in all of the forms, except for the nosotros and the vosotros. Depending on your teacher for your prior levels, you may have uh, learned, we call these boot verbs, right? You could draw a boot around everything except for the nosotros and the vosotros. Here, the O changed to a UE. All the way down, except for that nosotros and that vosotros form, because they were not part of the boot. So, as we look here, this only applies to AR and ER verbs that are stem changers. Basically, they follow the normal process. IR verbs are going to do something a little bit weird, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute. But if a verb is normally a stem changer, and it's an AR or an ER verb, you just follow your rules. An example of this is poder, which was an ER verb. Poder normally has a stem change from O to UE, so it still changes from O to UE everywhere except for the nosotros and vosotros, where it remains an O. Uh, my yo form of poder was puedo. I'm going to drop my O, and then I add my opposite ending, since poder was formerly an ER verb. I'm going to use AR verb endings, and I get pueda, puedas, pueda, podamos, podáis, puedan. An example in a sentence. Es bueno que podamos hacer esto, pero es necesario que todos piensen en el medio ambiente. It's good that we're able to do this, but it's necessary that everybody think about the environment. As I told you before, if a verb is an AR or an ER verb, and it's normally a stem changer, follow the normal process. Stem change it everywhere except for the nosotros and the vosotros. IR verbs are a little trickier. Okay, if a verb normally has a stem change in the present tense, and it's an IR verb, it's going to have the same stem change um, here in the subjunctive. However, it's also going to have an additional stem change in the nosotros and the vosotros forms. So what that means, if a verb is an IR verb, and it normally stem changes from O to UE, then it's going to change from O to UE in all of the forms except for the nosotros and the vosotros. In that nosotros and vosotros, instead of leaving it as an O, as you normally would do, it's going to change from an O to just the U. Okay? An example of this is the verb dormir. Okay? If, you're, if you were to look at dormir, uh, you know that the yo form of dormir is duermo. I'm going to chop off my O. I'm left with duerm. I go through and I put that in all the boxes and I add my opposite ending. Formerly, it was an IR verb. So it's going to use AR verb endings here instead. We get duerma, duermas, duerma, and duerma. All those boxes are good. But up here, instead of saying as D-O-R and D-O-R with dormamos and durmais, 
The O changes to a U and it becomes durmamos and durmais. So be careful with that. There's an additional stem change. So notice these are O to U E here when it's inside the boot. Whereas when it's outside the boot, it only changes from O to U. So notice that step, okay? So again, AR and ER verbs that are stem changers follow the normal process. They stem change everywhere in the boot, everywhere except the nosotros and vosotros, they stem change. IR verbs follow that same normal stem change. They follow whatever normal stem change they have, E to IE, O to UE, whatever, when it's inside of the boot. But when it's outside of the boot, there is a shortened stem change. A verb that is normally an O to UE stem change, and that nosotros and vosotros are just gonna change from O to U. A verb that normally changes from E to IE, or E to I, is just going to change outside of the boot there in E to I. Another example of that here is the verb servir. It was an IR verb, it normally is a stem changer, I form my yo and I get sirvo, uh, which is a knee to eye stem change. I chop off my o and I add the opposite ending. In this case, we're following those ar, so I get sirva, sirvas, sirva, sirvamos, sirvais, and sirvan. Now notice, if you had followed the normal rules, you would have servamos and servais. But because this is an ir verb stem changer, um, it's going to change here as well from E to I. Okay, Be careful with those. As you begin to get more practice, you'll feel better. So AR and ER, normal process, stem changes uh, everywhere except uh, when it's outside the boot. IR verbs, stem change normally inside the boot and then have an additional stem change outside the boot. Okay. Um, next, I want to talk to you about these cargars R verbs. You learned about cargars R verbs back whenever we studied the preterite, uh, you learn that verbs in an encar change to que, verbs in an engar change to ge, and verbs in an ensar change to se. Um, here we follow that same process, it's just that um, now these are not just irregular yo verbs like they were back in the preterite. Here um, you can conjugate an entire verb. So here you mostly need to know that the si and car changes to a q, uh, specifically really a QU, the GAR, the G changes to a GU, and the ZAR, the Z changes to a C. Uh, an example of this here, if you were to take the verb TOCAR and conjugate it, um, again, the C changes to a QU, so you get TOKE, TOKES, TOKE, TOKEMOS, TOKES, and TOKEN. It's not just K anymore, not just Q-U-E. The car part did change to K, then you still have all these other forms. So toque, toques, toque, toquemos, toques, toque. Jugar is a gar verb. The G in gar changes to G-U. Uh, you're obviously removing the A-R and adding those opposite endings of A, ace, A, amos, ace, in. So jugué, excuse me, huegué, huegues, huegué, juguemos, jugues. Wagon. And then almorzar, the C is changing, or excuse me, the Z is changing to a C. So you get almuerce, almuerces, almuerce, almorcemos, almorces, not in the boot there, and then almuercen. Okay, so just remember that with your car, cars, or verbs, um, the C in the car is changing to a QU. The G in gar is changing to a GU, and the Z in zar is changing to a C. Here's an example in a sentence. Es necesario que todos busquemos una solución. Uh, they took the verb buscar, they took off the AR, they added an EMOS. But then there was an additional change with a car verb where the C changed to a QU and ended up with busquemos. Another example. Es malo que el gallo empiece a cantar tan temprano. It's bad that the rooster began to sing so early. They took the verb empezar, which was his R verb, took off the AR, added the opposite ending, so instead of an A, they added an E, and then they changed the Z to a C. Empiece. 
Okay, there are irregular verbs in the subjunctive as well about which you should be aware. Um, these verbs are ones that you just have to memorize. And um, there are six of them. I always tell students to remember dishes. Dishes will give you all of these irregular verbs. Dar, ir, ser, haber, estar, and saber. Dar is translated as de, des, de, demos, des, and den. Ir becomes vaya, vayas, vaya, vayamos, vayais, vayan. Ser becomes sea, seas, sea, seamos, seais, and sean. Haber, haya, hayas, haya, hayamos, hayais, hayan. Estar, este, estéis, este, estemos, estéis, estén. And saber, sepa, sepas. Sepa, sepamos, sepáis, sepa. Okay, be very careful with these. You have to memorize these. Honestly, I usually tell my students, if you can just remember the yo form, then you're going to be able to unlock all the rest of these. So, dar becomes de, ir becomes vaya, ser becomes sea, haber becomes haya, estar becomes este, and saber becomes sepa. If you can memorize those irregulars, then you're going to ace that, okay? Now, let's go back to what we were saying with the subjunctive. You, you know how to conjugate the subjunctive now. You know what the subjunctive is, but when do I use it? Usually, uh, like I said, you have to have two subjects, a K, and some kind of weirdo verb. We're gonna get started here by talking about impersonal expressions as the I from weirdo. Now, an impersonal expression usually does not have a specific subject, and it generally includes a lot of adjectives. So um, we say these a lot, like, it's good that, blah, blah, blah. It's bad that, blah, blah, blah. It's important that, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can see a bunch of impersonal expressions that are written for you below here. Es buena idea que. It's a good idea that. Es mala idea que. It's a bad idea that. A lot of these are cognates. Es recomendable, es ridículo, es terrible. It's recommendable that, it's ridiculous that, it's terrible that. Es posible que, it's possible that. Es necesario que, necessary that. Es raro que, it's rare that. Es increíble que, it's incredible that. You see a lot of cognates here. Some that are not cognates, you have um, es justo que, it's fair that. Or es una lástima que, it's a shame that. Es mejor que, it's best that. These impersonal expressions um, always have a K following them. So es bueno que, es horrible que. You do have to have a K. This is hard for students to understand because in English, we don't have to have a that in the sentence. We can say uh, it's important we protect animals and it's important that we protect animals. And both of those are correct in English. But in Spanish, you have to have a K in order to use the subjunctive. So uh, notice in the sentence below, es importante que protejamos a los animales. It's important that we protect the animals. Notice my first subject is um, sort of unknown, sort of general, es importante que. And then we have a change of subject after the K, uh, which becomes we. So it's important that, that's general, the it might be my subject there, he, she, it. And then um, we is my second subject there. So es importante que protejamos a los animales. In this case, we use the subjunctive because we have an impersonal expression, es importante que. We have two subjects and a que. So my verb that comes after my second subject has to be in the subjunctive. We have protejamos here from the verb proteger. Another example. Es una lástima que haya animales en peligro de extinción. It's a shame that there are animals in danger of extinction. It's important, or it's a shame that, es una lástima que, is my impersonal expression. 
It's also my first subject there with it, using that he, she, or it box. And then aya uh, goes with my second subject of animales. So uh, es una lastima que haya animales. It's a shame that there are animals in danger of extinction. Now, I know this has been a lot of information, so remember, with the subjunctive, form the yo, drop the o, add the opposite, stem-changing verbs that are ar or er, follow the normal conjugation process, changing everywhere inside the boot, not changing outside the boot, ir verbs have their normal stem change in the boot, and have an additional stem change outside of the boot, and then you have those irregulars from dishes, okay? Keeping all that in mind, I want to give you a chance to practice with some of what you're learning. So, uh, in this activity titled, Es buena idea? Is it a good idea? Um, you can see in pink here, the subject for all of these sentences is either going to be, Es buena idea que él, it's a good idea that he, blah, 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 or no es buena idea que él, it's not a good idea that he. Every single one of these sentences is going to utilize the subjunctive because... We have an impersonal expression, es buena idea, we have a K, and we have a change of subject. We went from it's a good idea, just plain old it being my subject, to él, he being my subject. So we have all that we need. We have a weirdo verb with the impersonal expression, we have two subjects, and we have a K. Number one, es importante que él buscar un animal de un refugio. It's important that he look for an animal from a shelter. We're going to take the verb buscar. Um, we know that buscar is a cutter verb, so therefore it's irregular. Um, the C changes to a Q-U, so we can go ahead and do that. We know we're going to drop our AR, and we're saying he look for, so instead of using an A as my ending, we're using the opposite ending, it should be an E. Uh, so my final answer, no or sorry, es buena idea que él busque un animal de un refugio. It's a good idea that he look for an animal from a shelter. Um, I guess if he didn't want one, he would say, no, es buena idea que él busque un animal de un refugio. It says up here in the directions, which I did not read to you, sorry, that um, he's looking at adopting a new pet. Well, let's do another one of these. Number two. Either it is or it is not a good idea that he decide if he wants a dog or a cat. I would say it's probably a good idea that he decides first. So we're going to take the verb decidir here. Uh, we're going to conjugate it in the yo form, form the yo, decido, drop the o, and add the opposite ending. This was an ir verb. So instead of using ir verb endings, we're going to use the opposite, our ar verb endings. We're going to say, es buena idea que él decida si quiere un perro o un gato. All right, I want you to take a moment, and I'd like for you to give numbers three, four, five, and six a try for me. Go ahead and pause your audio. All right, now that you've had a second to give this a try, number three, it says it's a good idea that he pay for a deposit to the owner of the apartment. So, you know, sometimes you have to pay a little deposit when you have an animal. So it's important that he pay. It's buena idea que en pagar is going to change. It is a gar verb, so my G is going to change to a GU. Um, it was an AR verb, so instead we're going to add an E, our opposite ending. And you get pague. Number four, uh, it's a good idea that he adopt a big dog. I, I want to say that's a good idea because I love big dogs. So es buena idea que él adopte un perro grande. We took the verb adoptar. We chopped off our AR. Um, and we added our opposite ending. Form the yo, adopt, adopto, drop off the o, and add the opposite ending, adopte. Uh, and then same thing here with number five. It's a good idea that he consults with his roommate, consultar. We form the yo, consulto, drop the o, and add the opposite ending. This was an ar verb, so instead we're going to use our er ir verb ending, so we get consulte. And number six. Uh, it's not a good idea, no es buena idea, que él tener prisa al tomar su decisión. It's not a good idea that he be in a hurry with making his decision. Uh, we're going to form the yo, tengo, drop the o, and the opposite ending, this was an er verb, we're going to add an a, tenga. Okay, 
Hopefully you're starting to feel better about these. I have just a little bit more practice for you here with the subjunctive, with these impersonal expressions. Um, on number one, it says, Es terrible que todavía haber corridos de toros en algunos países. So it's terrible that there is still um, running of the bulls or bullfights in other countries, in some countries. In this case, our, our verb is haber. You may remember that haber is irregular in the in pretty much every tense, in the, in the present tense indicative, haber becomes I, whereas in the subjunctive, it becomes haya. Be careful here. We use the subjunctive because we had, number one, a K. Number two, a change of subject. We went from it's terrible that to there is. And number three, we had an impersonal expression, a weirdo verb. Be very careful. Make sure all those things are present before you use the subjunctive. We'll do one more. Number two, es una lástima que las tortugas marinas estar en peligro de extinción. It's a shame that uh, sea turtles are in danger of extinction. So I'm using the subjunctive here because I have two subjects. Number one, it's a shame that. And number two, the sea turtles. I have a that, a K. And I also have a subjunctive trigger, which in this case is a weirdo verb, an impersonal expression. So, es una lástima que las tortugas marinas, we're going to take estar, um, remember this is an irregular one from dishes, and it becomes estén, estén. Okay, I'd like for you to pause your audio, and please give numbers three and four a try for me. All right, now that you've had a second to try this, number three tells us, es urgente que nosotros Proteger los bosques. It's urgent that we protect the forest. Um, in this case, we're going to form the yo, proteger. The yo form of proteger actually gets a J. It becomes protejo. So be very careful there. A lot of people miss that up. Drop the O. Uh, this was originally an ER verb. So instead of using ER verb endings, we're going to switch and use the opposite. We're using AR verb endings. So it becomes protejamos, as you see there. And I'm going to top back the original. Okay, and then our last one in number four. Para conservar el agua, es necesario que las duchas ser rápidas. So, in order to conserve water, it's necessary that showers be fast. So, our first subject here, es necesario que, it. Our second subject, showers, duchas, or they. We have a que, indeed. And we have an impersonal expression, a weirdo trigger verb, es necesario que. So indeed, this is going to be in the subjunctive, and you may recall that um, ser is irregular. It's part of dishes, the irregular subjunctive. So ser became sea, 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 seamos, sei, sean. And we're talking about dishes or showers, duchas, or they. So it should be sean. Okay, and ladies and gentlemen, bringing us to our fourth and final grammatical point of the chapter. This is still related to the subjunctive you've been learning about. Just now, we're exploring the D of weirdo, which is doubt. We've already talked about impersonal expressions. We will now talk about doubt, and these others we'll learn about in another video. Um, so here, I want to remind you that you always use the subjunctive when, again, you have a K, a change of subject, aka two subjects, and some type of weirdo verb. In this case, you're going to have a weirdo verb from the D category or doubt. Um, anytime you're expressing any kind of doubt or any kind of uncertainty in Spanish, you're going to use the subjunctive always. Here's some very common expressions um, that trigger the subjunctive with doubt. Dudar que, which is to doubt that. So you would conjugate dudar. Dudo que, I doubt that. Dudas que, you doubt that. Duda que, he or she doubts that. Um, no creer que, not to think that. Uh, so I don't think that um, the sky is green. No pensar que, okay. also not to think that. Uh, another example, I don't think that um, she's going to lose her job. Well, is she going to lose her job? I don't know. There's some uncertainty there in my comment. Maybe she is, maybe she isn't. I don't think she is, but I'm not totally sure. There's some uncertainty or doubt. Uh, same thing here. No suponer que, I don't suppose that, or 
No estar seguro que. I'm not sure that. Uh, no es obvio que. It's not obvious that. No es evidente que. It's not evident that. No es verdad que. It's not true that. No es cierto que. It's not true that. All of these expressions always trigger the subjunctive when you see them. Got to be very careful with these, and I'll explain why in a second. First, I want to let you see some examples. Here you see a sentence. Duro que la cebra corra más rápido que el león. I doubt that the zebra runs faster than the lion. So my first subject here is yo, I. Um, duro que is my weirdo verb of doubt. Que is obviously just que, my, it has to be present. And here's my change of subject when I go to la cebra or the zebra. So I, first subject, doubt that the zebra, second subject, runs as fast as the lion. So I'm not totally sure. Maybe a zebra does run as fast as a lion. I don't know. There's doubt. There's uncertainty. I'm not for sure. I'm going to use the subjunctive in my verb that follows my second subject. So duro que la cebra corra más rápido que el león. Another example. No pensamos que los elefantes duerman. We don't think that elephants sleep. Well, we're not really sure. Do they sleep? Do they not? We don't know. There's some doubt. There's some uncertainty. Um, so, no pensamos que. My first subject here is nosotros. We. Um, no pensamos que is my subjunctive trigger from doubt, from weirdo. Que is there. Elefantes is my second subject. And all, all of those things are present for the subjunctive to be used. So, my verb coming after my second subject is going to be in the subjunctive, so you notice we have duerman instead of duermin. Okay, now, here's where it gets a little tricky. Okay, notice we have those same verbs just a second ago. Um, you see creer que, to believe that. Pensar que, to think that. Suponer que, to suppose that. Estar seguro que, to be sure that. And then... Uh, es obvio que, es evidente que, es cierto que, es verdad que, it's true that, it's evident that, it's obvious that. All of these trigger the indicative. And you're going, what? I thought we just said those trigger the subjunctive. Okay, so be careful. It, if you say, I think that, there's no doubt. I think that, um, my favorite color is blue. I'm affirming a belief or expressing certainty. That's using the indicative. I am sure that zebras are black and white. It's true that my house is the third house on the left. It's evident that White Duck Taco Shop has the best tacos in Johnson City. Okay, all of these things um, clearly affirm a belief or a certainty that I have, so I'm using the indicative. When I put a no in front and I say, I don't believe that, I don't think that, I'm not sure, I don't suppose that, it's not obvious that, that implies some doubt and I'm going to use the subjunctive. So just be careful as to know which one here. So here's some examples, again, affirming that use of the indicative tense. Supongo que a veces la casa es necesaria. I suppose that sometimes hunting is necessary. Es obvio que necesitamos hacer algo. It's obvious that we need to do something. In all of these cases, you see they're still in a personal expression, but we're affirming certainty. There's no doubt in this case. So in this case, we use the indicative. Be very, very careful with these. They can be tricky. All right. Um, oh, and sometimes when you use these in a question, like pensar and creer, it's actually common to use the subjunctive in that dependent clause, that part after the K, uh, because otherwise you're just affirming your belief. So you want to make sure you actually use the subjunctive here. For example, um, ¿Crees que haya suficiente comida para los animales? Do you think that there's sufficient food for the animals? If you were to use the indicative there and say, ¿Crees que hay suficiente comida para los animales? You're sort of leading your reader or the person to whom you're asking the question. You're sort of leading them to believe like you're, you're pushing your beliefs on them. Well, you believe that there's enough food for animals, don't you? 
right? That's what it would sort of come across if you were using the indicative. Whereas using the subjunctive here, you leave it nice and polite. Like, do you think there is enough food for our animals? You're, you're leaving it to where they can answer you one way or the other. Okay. Um, okay, so I have some for you to try here where they're all mixed together and you have to decide if we should use the subjunctive or if we should use the indicative. So number one says, creo que el caballo either es un animal fuerte or sea un animal fuerte. So I believe the horse is a strong animal. You notice here I've underlined uh, letter A, es, because creo que, I believe that, triggers the subjunctive. There's no doubt there. I believe that the horse is a strong animal. That's my belief. I'm affirming a belief. Look at number two, though. Duro que la tortuga, and my options are either corre rápido or corra rápido. Dude, okay, I doubt that. Boom, I'm saying I doubt. There's automatically doubt present. I know I'm going to use the subjunctive as long as there's a change of subject. I doubt that the turtle, oh, there's my change of subject. I doubt that the turtle runs quickly. So corre would be normal world indicative, and corra would be the subjunctive. So here I should say, dude, okay, la tortuga corra rápido. I want you to take a moment, and I want you to try numbers three and four for me, please. Go ahead and pause your audio and give these a try. All right, now that you've had a moment to try these, number three says, oh, I didn't mean to skip so far, sorry. Number three says, supongo que las gallinas. I suppose that the hens um, tienen miedo del zorro or tengan miedo del zorro. So, Remember, I believe that, I think that, I suppose that, all of those use the indicative because you're affirming a belief. So I suppose that the hens are afraid of the fox. Tienen miedo del zorro. Now be very careful. If I were to put a no in front of this and say I don't suppose that the hens, that uses the subjunctive because I'm not sure. I don't suppose. It would be tengan in that case. Be careful. Number four. Number four. Estoy seguro que el cabello... Um, and then your options are no necesita agua or no necesite agua. I'm sure that the camel does not need water. Okay, I'm saying I'm sure that. I'm pretty positive. I know. I'm affirming a belief. Estoy seguro que el camello no necesita agua. All right. I know these are hard, so I want to give you just a few more. Um, okay, number one, you see no pienso que. La oveja, and your options for comer carne are either come or coma carne. So notice, no pienso que. I do not think that the sheep eats meat. I don't think it eats meat, but I really don't know. Does it or does it not? I don't know. There's uncertainty. There's doubt. There's a change of subject. There's a weirdo verb. There's a K. I need to use the subjunctive here. No pienso que la oveja coma carne. I'm using the subjunctive. Okay, I want you to take a moment, pause your audio, and give numbers two, three, and four a try for me, please. All right, now that you've had a second to try these, number two, no es cierto que los pingüinos saben volar or sepan volar. It's not true that penguins know how to fly. Okay, in this case, by saying that it's not true, that's going to trigger the subjunctive, whereas it is true would trigger the indicative. So it's not true. No es cierto que los pingüinos sepan volar. Number three. No creo que el elefante salta o salte. I don't think that elephants jump. <laughs> well, um, I don't think that they jump, but I'm not sure. There's some uncertainty. So I am going to use the subjunctive, salte. And then number four, es obvio que el cocodrilo, and then no poder sacar la lengua. It's obvious that uh, a crocodile cannot take out its tongue. So it's obvious that, that triggers the indicative. I should say, no puede sacar la lengua. Okay, I have just one final activity for you here um, regarding the subjunctive and making sure you know how this works. If you feel good about this, you can stop at any time. This is just here to help you. Okay? 
Um, this is more subjunctive versus indicative. You have to decide which one is necessary. So uh, you're reading a conversation here between Miguel, Michael, and his profesor, his professor, his teacher. So Michael says, Profesor, profesor, ¿es verdad que haber muchos animales en peligro de extinción? Professor, is it true that there are a lot of animals in danger of extinction? Uh, remember, we're asking a question here, and we're not totally sure, right? There's some doubt. Is it true? I'm not saying it is. I'm just asking. So, es verdad que, I should say, haya muchos animales en peligro de extinción. The professor responds and says, Sí, es cierto. Yes, it's true. Es obvio que muchas personas no pensar en el medio ambiente. It's obvious that a lot of people don't think about the environment. So, my verb here was pensar. Es obvio que, it's obvious that, triggers the indicative. So, I said, es obvio que piensan. Okay, I want you to pause your audio and give these last few problems, numbers 3 through 7, a try for me, please. You can unpause when you're ready. All right, now you've had a second to try these. Number three, so we said it's obvious that a lot of people don't think of the environment and they do not believe that their actions affect the world very much. Isn't that true? Okay, that they affect. So our verb here is affectar. Um, they don't think their actions affect. Well, that's a little doubtful. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. They don't think they do. I need to take off ictad and conjugate it in the subjunctive here because there's doubt implied. And since they are saying their actions don't affect, we form the yo, afecto, drop the o, add the opposite ending, afectin. Um, as I continue, I say that yo creo que todos nosotros deber hacer nuestra parte. So I believe that all of us should do our part. Um, in this case, I'm saying, I believe that. I'm affirming my belief. This is the indicative. So I'm going to take deber. I'm going to chop off my ER and throw in my normal old indicative ending, debemos. So I think that we should all do our part. And Michael says, well, duro que yo poder cambiar las cosas. I think, I doubt that I can change things, or I doubt that I can make a difference. Well, I doubt, automatically, we know there's doubt present, so we might use the subjunctive, but there's a change of subject. And he says, I doubt that I. So in this case, there is no change of subject. I doubt that I am able to change things. So we should use the normal old present indicative here. Yo dudo que yo puedo. Now, if it said, I doubt that he can make a difference. I doubt that we can make a difference. That would use the subjunctive, but since there's not a change of subject, I doubt that I, it should just be puedo here. The professor says, well, no creo que saber todo lo que puedes hacer. I don't think that you know all that you are able to do. The professor, again, is uh, implying some doubt there. I don't think that you know all that you're able to do. There's doubt present. So no creo que and then saber is going to take the subjunctive form, so it should be sepas. And then finally, in the last one, um, Professor continues that es cierto que tú eres solo una persona, pero hay muchas organizaciones que buscan voluntarios. So it's true that you are, que tú eres solo una persona. True that you are just one person. Okay, no doubt there because we have a cierto. Okay, it's true that. All right, so you guys have come full circle in this chapter. You have learned how to identify vocabulary related to the environment and the animal world. You learned how to create sentences regarding what one will do in the future using the Spanish future tense. You've learned how to explain what someone has done in the past or what they have done using the Spanish present perfect tense. And finally, you've learned how to conjugate in the subjunctive, how to differentiate between subjunctive and indicative, and how to create sentences using the subjunctive in Spanish when impersonal expressions, doubt, or uncertainty are involved. Guys, as always, it has been a pleasure working with you. If any of you have any questions at any time or you get stuck on a mind type activity or whatever it may be, 
please ask me. Please send me an email. I am here to help you in any way that I possibly can. You can send a screenshot of your MindTap activity anytime. I'll look with it with you. We can Zoom and talk about questions one-on-one -on -one if you need that. I will do whatever I can to help you, so please do not hesitate to ask. I hope you're finding these videos helpful, and uh, I look forward to working with you more. Talk to you soon. Take care.